Hi, I'm Tara. Hi, I'm Michelle. Welcome back to our podcast Books and Beyond with Bowen. As you know, this is our quarantine edition and on this episode we spoke to Sonali Gupta. She is a mental health expert, she's a psychotherapist and most recently the author of the book called Anxiety. So the book uh you know put forward so many interesting points about how to deal with anxiety and it made us even call each other and talk about our mental health and open up to each other in ways that we hadn't before. Yeah Tara and I'm the anxious type and now especially during the pandemic it is much worse. I remember while reading the book we sent screenshots to each other with a message like hey does this happen to you too? And I wanted to know how Sonali being a therapist managed to pack so much information in such an accessible way, you know? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that I loved about the episode was when we spoke about the portrayal of mental health in films, TV and books and Sonali certainly had some very interesting takes on it. So listen to the episode and find out more. So welcome Sonali. Thank you so much Michelle and Tara for having me on the show. And I thank you for writing this book Sonali. Uh you know it made me feel really normal and okay for admitting to people that I'm anxious. So as a writer I have dealt with you know anxiety almost all my life and I really liked how your book you know resonated with us especially now during the pandemic. So we were wondering Sonali why now you know why did you uh, release your book in during these times? Yes thank you Michelle you know you know I'm so glad to hear that it made you feel seen in some way and I think that's the biggest compliment anyone can have you know as an author so 2019 you know is when I wrote the book in 6 and 1/2 months and the book was already lined up to release in May and you know when the pandemic happened it just seemed like everyone was talking about anxiety so you know the timing just seemed very surreal and almost like a divine plan in that sense because it's not that one wanted it i didn't write it you know for this it just that it released during this time where there was so much collective anxiety um, you know the book has some mention of covid because you know around april when i was doing the final edits i tweaked it for it to fit in the context of what was happening And Sonali, I think you know it really was surreal because it couldn't have come at a better time. It's so needed. You know, Michelle and I both read it, and it sort of, as Michelle said, made us feel normal about some of the very you know general things that we feel about burnout and workplace anxiety. And so, you know, we were wondering, um, you know, when you when you started writing the book, what was the agenda behind writing this sort of book and why did you pick anxiety as a topic because we know as your work as a psychologist you deal with a variety of different issues yes absolutely you know a lot of my work is around relationship grief self compassion so i worked 16 years from when you know from 2004 and one of the things which was very clear was that from 2014 onwards to from 2014 to 2018 you know there was an increase in the number of people who were reaching out in therapy because they struggled with panic attacks also an equal number of men and women when it came to anxiety thirdly also i felt anxiety as a topic you know anxiety is manageable and my entire trouble with today's narrative is you know anxiety has become so normalized that we think we just have to live with it so one of the reasons for writing the book also was to talk about that there's a problem when we are normalizing anxiety so much and second you know i i feel very deeply pain when people shame millennials i'm an elder millennial as elder as a millennial can get and i feel that you know uh, you know one of the reasons for writing this book was for you know people you know who are you know whether it's millennials gen z for them to relate to it and for them to know there are others who have similar battles and second was also for their parents you know other people who are older to understand how we live in a society that also adds to their anxiety and we need to learn to not shame them for their anxiety and mental health concerns Yeah and that's something that we really like Sonali because you know when something is normalized you know you just wonder whether you're a freak or whether you know you're just imagining it all so Sonali you know this is your debut book so we wanted to know about uh, you know the publishing experience you know was this commissioned or you know did you pitch it and why this for your debut book 
So yes, yeah, so this is the debut work when it comes to publishing and Harper Collins reached out to me. It's odd in a strange way. That was, um, this was in 2018, September, I guess. My editor, Sonal, reached out to me and she had a topic, you know, in hand, which was anxiety. And she also said that if I think that I want to write around relationships, since that's a space I've been talking a lot about and also working around, she said we could even think of it. At the same time, I took about four days to, you know, sit to think about it. And it just intuitively felt right to write about anxiety. And that's how the entire process began. So I've learned a lot now about how the writing happens, how the edits happen and what a book like this now requires. And, uh, you know, there is no Indian book around anxiety or mental health um, written in a similar format. And I don't mean that in a boastful way. I mean it in the sense that there were no templates for me to look at. So it was also a journey of figuring my own, you know, process. And I find that really interesting because this is something that affects every single person in India. Um, So, you know, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, what kind of structure you envisioned for the book and how you then executed that? And it's amazing. You took only six months. That's fantastic to write a whole book. That's amazing. Uh, Thank you so much. To be honest, I thought most writers take that I lived in a bubble of my own, I guess. My biggest primary agenda for writing this book was that A, it should be accessible. B, it should be priced at a level that everybody can also have access to it. C, it should be something that people can read and make sense of it and not something that only addresses a certain section of the society. So one of the first things was to define what anxiety looks like and what it feels like. Uh, One of the things I speak about in the book is about how 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. is the panic hour. So this was one observation I've had over the last 16 years. And, you know, while I've spoken about it to friends, to clients, I realized that so many people didn't know about it. And worldwide, there is no literature that's addressing it. And I felt that it was important to maybe break it down into very palpable factors like this or talk about how anxiety also gets locked in the body. So the idea was to unpack what anxiety physically, somatically can feel like. And that was the first, you know, and that's how the first section on understanding anxiety. The the second, you know, a, a huge part of my narrative was to also make it clear that we live in a world that also fuels our anxiety. And that's why, you know, the workplace, social media, technology, because I also feel that every time millennials are being shamed and we are, you know, putting individual responsibility on them, society is forgetting the lens of collective responsibility. And the entire second section was done to help understand the kind of world we live in. How does that also add to our anxiety? And that's why also... The chapter on relationships, you know, anxious and love. And the most important bit, you know, was, um, so, you know, the book clearly says this is not a substitute for therapy. It was most important for me that people know how to manage their anxiety. You know, we are such a huge nation. And I felt it was very important to build a toolkit for people to figure out What are some of the techniques they can have in the immediately short term and long term? And that's how the last section on managing anxiety. Yeah, so Nali, what we really liked about the book was the way you have, you know, uh, divided everything into digestible small texts. And, you know, talking about not having a template, uh, you know, to write about mental health in India, Tara and I really like uh, reading a lot of fiction. And what we really liked was, you know, seeing uh, Jerry Pinto's introduction to your book. And we loved M and the Big Whom. So, Sonali, do you think fiction is, uh, you know, a good form to really enlighten others about mental health? Till the time they are done tastefully and they are also done keeping in mind how mental health conditions manifest themselves. 
So I think all those books around fiction that do a good job of doing their research well, they say, you know, they allow the awareness to really happen. You know, Jerry's books are wonderful. And in that context, you know, US literature has some books, you know, around fiction, which have managed to do a beautiful job of weaving a fictional narrative to mental health. Uh, you know, I read recently this book called The Silent Patient. Have you read the book? Yeah, I read it. I read it. It was I, crazy. I, I <laughs> haven't read and I really want to because everyone's, you know, just saying so many good things about so, it. You know, so a friend suggested the book to me and I read it. And, uh, you know, it is a fiction book. It's a psychological thriller. The important bit is the bits around therapy, the bits around um, mental health. A lot of them are documented really well you know and I think those books you know if you know we have books like that they really then help people understand what's happening and I think in that sense fiction you know sometimes makes it easier because you know the defensiveness is lost right like you know people are likely to be less defensive to put you know to pick a fictional book over something which is direct at the same time, I do want to say this, you know, the books that are not done with good enough research, they come at the risk of also damaging the mental health lens. And uh, yeah, that is really interesting, uh, Sonali. And, you know, while you were speaking, it reminded me of two books actually in Indian fiction, which, uh, you know, Tara and I both really liked. Uh, so one is Girl in White Cotton by Avni Doshi. And the other one is uh, The Body Myth by Ria Mukherjee. And both of them actually talk about uh, mental health in very uh, unique ways. Ah, okay. No, I haven't, but I'll read them now. I, I, I still have books that I want to read. So I'm going to read both of them. Yeah, I mean, there's, they always have a big, big list of books to read. But I, I really agree with, you know, um, especially the portrayal, if it's not well researched, uh, that can do so much damage. And there is so much conversation nowadays around mental health and mental health issues. And I feel like a lot of it actually does more, can do more damage than actually help people because it's so not substantiated, you know. And that's why books like yours, which put in, um, you know, theory, put in things which are accessible to the general can really help. Uh, but coming back to your writing process, Sonali, I'm still in awe of how you managed to complete the book in six hours because I know that you also um, obviously are working full time as, you know, a clinical psychologist. So what was your writing routine like? How did you manage, you know, oscillating between uh, counseling and then, you know, sitting and writing this book? So, you know, to be honest, even now when I think about it, I don't know how I managed to do it, <laughs> you know, those six months. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest things was that really helped is, you know, having an editor who was in sync with how I envisioned the book. So, you know, I think it really went a long way because we were seeing the same things. We wanted it to look the same way. So, you know, as I said, the structure was in place about understanding anxiety, managing anxiety. And what I worked around was I would set a timeline of 10 days to about finish a particular topic, do only research around it, and then maybe do most of my writing on the weekends. And on the weekdays, you know, if, you know, I would take once a month, I would take an off to focus on the book, you know, I would not go to work at all. And otherwise, uh, I think what really helped me the most was not telling anyone I'm writing the book. <laughs> Wow, really? I mean, it's really difficult uh, as a writer to, you know, not tell people that you're working on a project. And so how did you, you know, how did you control that urge, Sonali? I was supremely scared that what if I don't manage to finish the book in six months? And I felt that if I don't tell people, nobody is going to ask me when the book is going to be out, when it's going to be ready. And that and that will actually reduce Absolutely. your anxiety. <laughs> that makes me that that just made me think about how anxious it makes you when people ask oh. you when's your next book out, when's your next work out. <laughs> No, absolutely. You know, you're spot on about it. So I also had my anxiety that I don't want the sword hanging over my head. My editor can ask me, but other people don't need to ask me, you know, and I don't want to tell anyone. I also had this belief that if I discuss a lot of ideas and if I talk about it, the idea may lose the charge attached to it. It will be open to public opinion. People will have their own opinions. 
Yeah, so Nali, I often feel the same way, you know, because, uh, you know, as somebody who's running her own business, I have a lot of ideas all the time. And, you know, I, I sometimes can only have the bandwidth to implement, you know, just a few of them. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, if I, you know, talk too much about what I want to do, then it does lose steam. So I completely relate. But Sonali, what I'm I'm really interested in, and Michelle and I were talking before this podcast, is that you've been writing for a while. So you've been writing, you know, you write for the Swaddle, you have a column in Mumbai Mirror, which I I actually really, I follow it. So writing's always been a part of, uh, it seems a part of your journey. So how did you first come to writing? And why writing? Uh, When I was about three and a half, four, I used to stutter and I was in speech therapy and I was massively bullied for the stuttering. I became this very quiet child. So people from my school would believe I'm this girl who doesn't talk at all because, you know, I spent my entire school life being quiet. Although I spent six months in speech therapy and it was fine. At that time, and you know, I had a lovely speech therapist. I actually have memories of the speech therapist from the time I was four or something and this memory of bullying. And, you know, and my mom realized how sensitive I am, how perceptive I am. So by the time I was six and a half, seven, my mom would cut out articles from newspapers. She was a homemaker, which talked about, you know, where therapists would be writing maybe once in a month. And she would tell me about how if you need to tell your stories, there are therapists that exist. And I think by the time I was eight, nine, I was sure this is what I want to become and nothing else. And I think that's the theme that continued all my life. And I think as someone, and I think there has always been this lens of wanting to tell stories. And I would write ever since I was 12, 13. And I think as someone who barely spoke, you know, it saved me pretty much. And, um, you know, I've also grown up with a father who was in the hospital ever since I was 10. He may have had 100 surgeries or more, you know, so 25 years. He was in and out of hospital. So I think reading and writing pretty much saved me. And they were my not just coping mechanisms, but also a space where I could express myself. And that's how I took to writing. And, um, you know, and even back then I would write in English. I would also write in Hindi. So I would write between two languages. And I think that's how I've been writing for years. So it's very interesting that you spoke about, you know, um, how your parents introduced you to this concept, because, um, you know, even I was very interested in psychology. I remember uh, thinking about actually going into this field, but I really didn't know too much about it. And I didn't know, uh, you know, that you can make a career out of it. So it's interesting that you knew from the age of seven um, and also, you know, so many of the things that you're saying are resonating with me because. Um, I've been labeled quiet my entire life, you know, and books were sort of a refuge for me. And you mentioned that reading was sort of your comfort. So what are some of your current comfort books or books that you always go back to, you know, when you just want to take a break? You know, when I was 18, one of my professors introduced me to this book called I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. And, you know, in times when I'm struggling, uh, you know, I often go back to thinking about that book. Otherwise, I go back, my comfort reads are a lot of poetry. So, you know, I go back to like, I'm a big fan of Rilke's work, whether it's movies, you know, whether it's good shows, they are a good way of centering myself. And at the same time, a reminder that even if you have your own way of navigating the world, you can still process and go on with it. Yeah, and we all have our comfort reads, as you mentioned, Sonali, you know, those books that you can go back to and always feel better. So, Sonali, what is easier for you? Because you obviously, you know, do a lot of talk work and also you're a writer. So is it easier for you to convey your thoughts through talking or is it easier for you to convey your thoughts through reading? I'm just curious to know. At this stage, it's both. I have spent a large part of my life not talking. So I really, really enjoy when I'm talking, when I'm, you know, making a presentation, when I'm doing a webinar. It's almost like I love that, you know, I love that space. Uh, You know, the reading, the writing bit is like this quiet presence that allows ideas to grow and that allows to communicate complex, nuanced lenses there. So at this stage, you know, I am very comfortable with both those at the end of the day. And, you know, I would really want to embody both of them. And, 
you know, because I think sometimes, you know, when people have short attention spans, even a TED talk of 10 minutes can say a lot and it can maybe even motivate people to push, you know, to pick a book. So at this stage, I'm at a point where I would really want to do both of them and maybe navigate my life around, you know, both those roles eventually. That's really uh, inspiring, Sonali, how you really managed to, you know, do justice to both the roles and they're very, uh, you know, different from each other. They do demand uh, different skills. And also, Sonali, what we were really, uh, you know, intrigued by in the book were the various uh, kinds of, you know, stories from clients. And we were wondering, how did you manage to get, you know, these stories? And, you know, did you have to keep them confidential as a, you know, psychologist? Yes, you know, all the stories, they are pretty much tweaked and they are changed. So they are composite stories. So they are not about that one person at the end of the day. They are combination of various stories put together where, you know, uh, the names are changed, you know, uh, the age is changed, you know, the gender is changed, all of it. And in all those cases, you know, I spoke to them and I said that, you know, if we were to mention small bits of it, you know, and uh, or like, you know, when I use the term, when I use certain terms, you know, and I said that, you know, this is something from our conversations. I had conversations with them. My first 10 years of my work from 2004 to 2014, I used to work on a university campus. So I used to work at the ISS. So I would see a lot of students. And in my initial years, I did a lot of work at grassroots levels. I worked on various projects. And I think the stories have emerged over a period of time, you know, and they have just stayed and they were they were living within me. And a book allowed for those stories to come out in this form, in the form of case histories. And they have just remained from 2004, you know. And I think that's one of the bits, uh, you know, I feel most happy about because a lot of people, when they feel seen or understood, I think it's these stories that make them feel seen or understood. Sometimes just reading that makes it clear to them what their thought processes are, you know, and... And some of my clients, of course, feel very happy when there are, you know, other people, their friends who have read the story and they say, listen, I relate to this character the most, you know, like there's the one which is about the itch, you know, about the script writer who's struggling. Uh, I really love the chapter about the itch and I like that you named it the itch. Um, And for those listeners who don't know, um, Sonali has said that, you know, every time you want to pick up your phone in the middle of a task and you want to pick up your phone, that refers to the itch. And I feel it too, because I'll be just chilling, watching TV, it'll be my downtime. And I can't, I find that I can't even do that properly. You know, I'll just pick up my phone and I'll just be browsing. And so I really, really like how you've named, you know, specific things. You've also uh, talked about, you know, errand, um, you know, errand fatigue. Uh, where you where we put off our errands and then it becomes like a big mountain. So all of these things were, were super, super interesting, Sonali. Yeah, and another thing that I found relatable in the book, Sonali, was how, uh, you know, we just postponed replying to emails and then there is an anxiety that because we delayed uh, replying to those emails. Michelle, you and I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and it was very, uh, you know, relatable. And so something that really stood out in your book, Sonali, was how you address the fact that, you know, uh, men and women uh, experience anxiety very differently. Um, so when you were thinking of, you know, ideal readers for your book, Sonali, were you thinking of it in that way? Like, you know, male readers, female readers and how they might relate to it? So, you know, thank you for, you know, sharing your experiences and coming back to what you're asking, Michelle, the, uh, I was very keen and I was very clear that I wanted this to become a book that both men and women read. So that was very, very clear. I didn't want it to become the kind of literature that only women are going to read. So it was of massive importance to me. And that's why I felt even with the examples and how they are divided, I consciously chose the age groups. I consciously chose certain names because it was very important to me that we address both genders. I also have a massive problem with the fact that a lot of mental health uh, literature doesn't address men's concerns. So I also come, you know, from a personal ideology where I feel that if we need any degree of change in the society structurally, we need to offer literature that addresses the, you know, 
both concerns which men and women may feel or struggle with and so it was a very conscious process of using certain names using certain examples and also talking about the differences so that the book makes sense for both the genders Yes, yeah, so Sonali, you know, I have really uh, observed the kind of, uh, you know, exposure that mental health has been given, uh, you know, in films, in books. Um, so you know, I was really uh, intrigued to know whether you know you really like the way uh, mental health is portrayed in mainstream media. So one movie that comes to mind is Dear Zindagi, and uh, you know, we wanted to know if there's, uh, you know, any other films that you think, you know, the our listener should watch, or there's any other resources that we can go to. So you know, when it comes to representation of mental health in the country, um, I think, I think we are still at a very initial nascent stage there, and I figured that people. Google search for therapists like Jahangir Khan. Jahangir Khan was Shah Rukh Khan's name in the movie, and guess what? It opens up to my article which I wrote for Scoopo, and I would actually have people who write emails to me and either asking for a session or discussing their problems. So. you know so this is where we are you know in the context of and you know dear zindagi was few years back and i've always found that very amazing you know because i never thought anybody would search for psychologist or doctor like jahangir khan that's very that's very very funny and that just shows you know how little there is out there but also it shows a power of seo i have to say um so that that's a great thing but coming to you know the fact that you actually wrote about this so you know did your writing for uh, dna mumbai mirror all this journalistic experience how did that help you when it came to writing your book is yeah, that so all? you know i think so you know in 2018 when i was signing the book contract i start mumbai mirror reached out at the same time so the first column i wrote for mumbai mirror was about how marriage is being treated as this new aadhar card so that was you know based on a client experience and my personal experience and and the first column was received quite well it was you know a weekly column at that point and i started realizing that a lot of my readers and you know i had not been writing of course mainstream you know on a weekly basis i started realizing that the case studies you know or personal experiences of clients made so much difference i also began to realize how people were responding to narratives of warmth and compassion and understanding that a process of therapy and right you know takes time and they were okay with having ambiguity with how the stories are ending so my mumbai mirror experience definitely has inspired the entire book you know and i have even acknowledged it you know in the book itself one time i wrote this piece on resilience and there was somebody who wrote me an email about how they were struggling with a difficult decision and just reading that piece that story which belonged to somebody else seemed like their own story and it gave them the closure they wanted in their life and uh, you know and it was this very deeply moving mail that somebody had sent they didn't expect a response from me and i think in all those moments for me it seemed more and more clear how i want the book to look so sonali uh, can i be honest with you while i was reading your book actually you know um it kind of uh, caused this uh, anxiety in me while i was reading you know like each each subtitle was kind of you know like a trigger and i was wondering is this me is this me <laughs> so is that normal sonali or uh, you know like was it just me i really want to know thanks for sharing that michelle and you know when you are reading a book you know which is on anxiety and all of us have struggled with anxiety the titles will speak to us and it's normal to feel that at the same time the idea is to remember that anxiety is not a negative emotion and you know and when you're reading a book like this it is very normal to look within and it triggers a process of introspection even for those who have never done it oh that's that's really good to know sonali <laughs> thank you and that's why for anyone who's reading and you know who's listening to this podcast one of my tips is open any page that makes sense to you and read it 
Yeah, and also Sonali, what we what we really liked about the book is, you know, there were no not many jargons. You know, it was really accessible to any kind of reader. Did you tailor it to, you know, make it more accessible to even lay people who 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 don't really understand, uh, you know, psychology terms? I made it a conscious choice to not have jargon because most of the books that exist, you know, either in our country or you know even you know otherwise, a lot of them are very heavy on jargon and which can be a big put off. So, you know, while I was writing the book, I really envisioned that if even 15, 18 year olds have to read the book in an Indian setup, what would it feel like for them? I envisioned what would some of my clients, you know, if they were to read the book, would there be something that they can still have have as a takeaway? And I did imagine, you know, primarily an Indian audience, but I also imagine that you know, that some of the concerns when it comes to relationships, workplace, they globally exist. The entire idea was to write a book which came from a place of being non-judgmental and compassionate. And I think that was my primary parameter and the ease of language. I, you know, I didn't want it to, you know, sound very complicated. I wanted it to work across, you know, even people who are reading the book first time, you know, like some people, start, you know, have even written to me saying that this is their first ever book. And I think if it's your first ever book and it makes sense to you and it doesn't have too many complicated terms and you still finish the entire book, I think it's an achievement for them, honestly. So you really do that, Sonali. Your book is very accessible um, and obviously very informative. And, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, um, how you play around with different roles um, and, you know, how writing has shaped your journey. So have you considered writing fiction and what is your next book if you are writing another one? So yes, I have considered I have considered writing fiction. I have also considered writing fiction for a show, for a series. So I've considered both those and I have wanted to do that for the longest time. Wow, that's so cool, Sonali. If you if you ever do write a series, please let us know. We really want to check it out. Yes, definitely. So that's what, you know, that's what I have envisioned for myself. One of the books I will write at some point is about relationship, dating, because that's an area I absolutely love working. So I find that very fascinating, Sonali, because even I love this topic and Michelle and I have always discussed, you know, uh, creating something um, along the lines of, you know, love stories or rom-coms and things like that. And we saw that you're a consultant with Tinder, which is a topic for another podcast. But um, I mean, I find it very interesting that uh, your first sort of fiction would be around this topic and also OTT. So yeah, we find it really interesting that your first project will be, uh, you know, OTT. That's really cool. So what we also liked about the book, Sonali, is how you've addressed journaling and, you know, morning pages. So journaling is something that that has really helped me, you know. So I began journaling when I moved away from home for the first time when I went to Bangalore. And it, you know, it helped me deal with so many things like, you know, going away from home, meeting new people. So, um, you know, it it basically helped me deal with anxiety. So uh, I wanted to you know know uh, like tara what is what is something that you know you're really anxious about and what has uh, you know helped you cope with all of it well that's quite a personal question and i'll try my best to uh, you know to to answer it in an as, as honest a way uh, you know i mean so many things cause us anxiety you know um, in general life and so ali you must have seen so many but i think what resonated to me most from the book you know the things that really stood out for me was one is labeling um, you know we go through our whole lives you know being called certain names and sometimes we internalize those names and for me it's been really hard to sort of break out of that you know one of the things that people have called me my whole life is quiet and introvert you know but i i i'm like no actually you know i'm a really fun person <laughs> And now we're going to move on to something a little more fun. We have a rapid fire round uh, where we're going to ask you questions and hopefully you can answer rapidly. So therapy or writing? Therapy. What is your favorite place to write, Sonali? My couch, you know, in my hall where most of the book happened. Yes. Books or TV series? During the pandemic, I moved to books. Uh, when I was writing, I would watch a lot of TV series and not read much. So, yes. 
one book that you would recommend uh, for anyone who's interested in getting into psychology? I never promised you a rose garden. Your favorite travel destination? London. And your favorite food? I have these tomato sandwiches, which are my favorite comfort food. <laughs> What's your favorite food, Tara? Oh, I do any sort of Asian food. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, yeah, same here. I like home food, you know, and now with, I think, pandemic, I've just begun to, you know, um, appreciate it all the more. Exactly, yeah. So, I think we're out of questions, Sonali. So, thank you so much, Sonali, for, you know, talking to us, for, you know, sharing your thoughts. We just loved reading your book. And, you know, it made us feel normal. It made us, you know, feel uh, that, you know, we are just like everybody else and that, you know, we should basically acknowledge what we are going through. And that's how we can uh, overcome it and deal with it better. So thank you so much, Sonali. It was so much fun talking to you. Sonali is such an inspiration for anybody who wants to share their expert knowledge to a wider audience. And in this episode, we found out so much about how to even deal with the issues that we're facing in the pandemic. So on our next episode, we'll be speaking to the author Damianti Biswas. She is the author of the book You Beneath Your Skin. And this is a fine chilling thriller. It's so full of plot twists, twists and turns that you will be sure to be at the edge of your seat right till the very end. So if you haven't picked it up, do pick it up. And it's also one of those books that addresses social issues in a very unique way. Um, so we're really looking forward to chatting with her about all this and more. And if you love thrillers, you should definitely tune in. As always, we are on Instagram. We have a new handle at Bound Podcast. So be sure to follow us. And our other handles are at Bound India on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Until next time.